This is Michael Smith of MedPage Today. I'm in Philadelphia at the annual meeting of the Infectious Diseases Society of America, where resistance to antimicrobials is a hot topic. Since the days of sulfa drugs and penicillin, most people have assumed that infectious diseases are beatable. But in fact, resistance to the antibiotics is growing, and new antibiotics are not coming down the pipe. Joining me today to discuss the issue are Dr. Brad Spellberg of the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, Dr. Spellberg is the author of a recent book, Rising Plague, which details the issue of antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. And Dr. David Gilbert, a former president of the Infectious Diseases Society, who is at the Providence Health System in Portland, Oregon. Gentlemen, this is a hot topic. This has been an issue now for some time. I think most physicians are aware of the issue of antibiotic resistance, but why are we not seeing new drugs? Dr. Spellberg, you uh, are, are aware of some, some serious issues about this, and you mentioned some of them yesterday. What, what are the issues? Uh, why, why are new drugs not being developed? I think there's, there's m many reasons why we're having trouble developing antibiotics, but they can be generally categorized into one of two big groups. One is economic, and the second is regulatory. The economic factors are, there are actually several economic factors, but the biggest one is just that antibiotics are taken for short periods of time, seven days, ten days, and then the patient stops taking them. And companies would rather invest their research and development dollars to develop a drug somebody's going to take every day for the rest of their life, like a drug for high blood pressure, high cholesterol, arthritis, dementia, or even, uh, you know, for things like cancer. They're going to have a much bigger return on investment than they are for developing uh, antibacterial drugs. In terms of regulatory, there is a, a very complicated situation at the FDA where they're struggling with how to deal with interpretation of clinical trials of antibiotics uh, for a variety of reasons, and uh, it's just bogged down the drug approval process for antibacterial agents. I see. Dr. Gilbert, this has obviously been a, a topic that has grown over the years. Where are we going with this? Are we, are we going to go back to the bad old days when there aren't, were no drugs and we just get infectious, disease, infectious diseases and die? Well, I don't know if it's going to be that bad, but it does look like we're staring at a potential abyss, if you will, where we have uh, the need to keep using the drugs that we have and no new drugs on the horizon, increasing resistance. So we're using the existing inventory with increasing frequency. That leads to more resistance. That leads to more use of the drugs. And so it's this vicious cycle. In the past, uh, the pharmaceutical industry has bailed us out. Now, for the reasons that Brad has just said, uh, the cost of doing studies keeps going up and up and up. And so it's no longer a high incentive for industry to invest in this class of drug. And as said, they would rather invest in the lifestyle drugs, if sure. you will. Well, physicians, though, uh, I mean, to some extent, are, are to blame for this because they were prescribing a lot of these drugs, often sort of holus bolus. But ha there's been a lot of emphasis on not doing that, you know, making sure you've got a, 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 a bacterium rather than a virus, for instance. Is that making any difference at all? Yeah, there's some modest success, actually, uh, as we have increased the awareness of the problem. Some of that success was described at this meeting. Uh, France, for example, uh, was one of the highest utilizers of antibacterial drugs in the world. The government and the regulators and the professionals in France said, oh my, we don't want to be the leaders in this area, <laughs> <laughs> and, and spent a ton of money uh, in an educational campaign, and they are no longer the leader in terms of overusers of uh, antibiotics. So that can have an effect, but I don't think that's going to cure the problem. Okay. Well, Dr. Spellberg, I mean, this seems to be one of those things. Evolution will happen. If we're going to be using any antibiotics, the, yeah. the microbes are going to try and get around that. Yeah, we need to move past this concept that this problem is the fault of physicians, and if physicians would just behave, this problem would go away. What we do when we prescribe an antibiotic, whether it's appropriate or not, is we increase selective pressure. So organisms that are already resistant get selected for. We are not creating the resistance. If you want to blame someone for creation of resistance, you blame the bacteria. This is them, they, and they've been doing this for two billion years. They've been doing this for much longer than we've ever even known these drugs exist. So they're very good at it. They're good at it, and they're already resistant to drugs we haven't developed yet. 
they've been developing drugs and defeating drugs or developing compounds and defeating compounds that we call antibiotics for two billion or so years. So we increase selective pressure when we prescribe an antibiotic. If 100% of our prescriptions were appropriate, there would still be resistance. It would just develop more slowly. So while it's critical that we continue our stewardship efforts to try to slow down resistance, we have to marry conservation efforts with restoration efforts. So we have to restore the antibiotic resource in addition to, as Dr. Gilbert is saying, preserving what we have now. What then can be done? I mean, it, it seems to me there's, there's you, you said two aspects. There's the, the, the corporate aspect, getting companies, drug companies, to make new antibiotics. The other one is the regulatory issue. Are there, are there simple answers to those questions? <laughs> I don't think there is a simple, simple answer. We've been trying to reduce the disincentives. We've been trying to make it easier to work with the regulators and allow them to make, to ensure the public at the same time that the drugs that they're approving are safe and efficacious. So uh, we've been working around the periphery, but it really is time to take a broader look now. And I think it's going to take a global uh, effort. It's going to take a coalition effort because uh, I don't think industry is going to be able to be the group that bails us out uh, as a sole entity. In the past, they've done that. You know, they've they've gotten enough money together to and enough new drugs together that they could go through the process. Uh, but I, I think just from a monetary point of view, the cost of bringing a new drug to market, because it takes like 10 years and a lot of people and um, many, many standards that you have to jump through, hoops that you have to jump through. So I think it's going to be a combination of, of government and academia and uh, uh, philanthropic organizations, public-private uh, inter inter interactions working together along with maybe some changes in laws to pr provide some more incentives in terms of patents and so forth. But it, it, it's going to have to be a group effort and it really brings to my mind some of the uh, moral obligation statements. You know, we've been talking, we're in healthcare reform now, and is it a moral obligation for everybody to have access to health care? Well, part of that is should everybody have access to antibiotics that are safe and effective? And I think it's going to be a group effort yes. and, a, and a global group effort. Well, I, let me, can, sure. my, I, you know, I, and obviously I completely agree with everything David is saying. Um, there are, are some specific things that IDSA has been pushing for for some years now since they put out their initial white paper in 2004. You know, Dr. Gilbert mentioned, you know, we do need some kind of economic incentives focusing on the development of, of really needed antibiotics, not Me Too drugs, but drugs that treat organisms resistant to what we have now. So these would be things that Congress are, is going to have to help us with. Economic incentives that may involve patents, that may involve uh, tax credits or other ideas that are already out there. Now, these are not new ideas we have to come up with. Uh, we, need do, we need better infection control efforts to stop infections from happening in the first place. We do need to continue to strengthen our antibiotic stewardship. So there's a lot of things that have to be done, and as Dr. Gilbert is saying, a lot of constituents are going to have to be at the table to make all this happen. That's a complicated process. Where are we? Is, are, are, we are we moving ahead on this? Is there, is there hope for the future? Tell us there's hope for the future. There's yeah. always hope. There's always hope, and, and I always have confidence in the creative ingenuity of uh, humans that are involved in this enterprise. And even as we speak about the problem, there are small startup drug companies that have some really pretty exciting molecules, some, some new drug candidates that they're looking at but they're all facing the, these obstacles, and so we just have to help them through the process. And, and you know, IDSA has been very active in trying to work with FDA to provide clarity from the regulatory perspective to simplify how drugs get developed. Uh, we are trying to make Congress aware of the problem. We could really use the help of the constituents of these politicians so that the constituents tell their politicians, this is important to us when we vote, and we want you to fix this problem. Uh, so, so a lot is trying to be done, and as Dr. Gilbert is saying, we need to bring all the constituents to the table. In um, when did Sputnik go up? In fifty-seven. In 1957, Jack Kennedy said, "In 10 years, we're going to the moon." 
So I think uh, it's that kind of commitment that we need here. We need the commitment that in 10 years from now, we'll have 10 new classes of antibacterials. Uh, um, uh, a powerful target. Gentlemen, thank you for your insights. It's a difficult issue, and I hope uh, you're quite right. In 10 years, we have 10 new classes. Thank you. In Philadelphia, I'm Michael Smith, MedPage Today.